Well, I think we might as well get started. We've been finding with these sessions that people kind of stream in once we get going. Okay, right? cool. Um, so that will probably happen. Um, so uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to, uh, I think, a, a first for uh, Vancouver and maybe for um, for all of Canada uh, to have um, uh, a lot of the players in the NABU puzzle uh, here in the room. And uh, if you've never heard of the NABU before, um, you know, that's not too big of a surprise because many of us had never heard of one before. Um, but um, we um, are very fortunate to have the uh, uh, internet presence, presence of Leo Benkowski uh, with us. He uh, was, I think, the main programmer or only, only programmer? No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the NABU had lots of people, so no, no. I'm just, oh, okay. I'm just somebody who... Uh, I, I sort of rose up through the ranks. I started when I was like 18 years old, just like literally when I was still in high school, uh, writing video games for NABU, and I ended up becoming director of content development, and I was there pretty much in, when it shut down. So I, there's a lot of story to that that some of some of you might have seen already, but uh, maybe we'll touch mm -hmm. upon it as we talk. Yeah, I'll introduce our other uh, panel members um, in uh, sort of in the order in which I heard about uh, the NABU. I, I first heard about it from Adrian Black's video and then dismissed it as something, you know, that I probably wouldn't spend money on. Um, and then um, it was uh, David Vanderduthen in the um, year, um, I think was the first person that I heard that you bought one. And I thought, really? Maybe I should have bought one. I actually put one in my inbox or my uh, uh, shopping cart and didn't check it out. Um, and uh, then the next thing I know, I hear Riz Acup, so, um Almost needs no introduction because if you've ever been on an online forum that talks about anything related to computers, video games, you've seen him. He posts on everything. It's just amazing. Um, and um, then last but not least is um, Grant Shannon at the uh, far end. Um, and Grant's uh, an interesting guy. He, he has an amazing list of skills. He seems to be good at almost everything. Um, except maybe public speaking, because I kind of had to to go some to convince him to do this. Um, you can sing. I, well, you know what? And I, I think I take some credit for making him sing. If he can sing, he can talk, you know. So uh, so I, I um, first met him, I think when I first started organizing a computer club, I discovered that there was already a meetup group for one. And that's how I first connected with Grant. And I think he was involved like right from when we start, first started as well. Um, and uh, has been a, a real follower the entire time. Um, but what he's demonstrated is uh, amazing skills um, as a uh, uh, electronics technician, as uh, a restorer, uh, and even a um, expert in, in doing recreations of uh, historic systems, um, and just a, a host of other things. And as it turned out, he's also a great guitar player and a pretty decent singer, even though it took some coaxing to get him to to sing so he's he's in uh, my band out in uh, Chilliwack he comes out once a week for practices and um, he plays uh, he, uh, actually I should say he played guitar at first and then he moved over to drums briefly and then to bass from there so uh, he really only needs the rest of us for set dressing that we can and he play, I know he plays keyboard as well but he he's too polite to tell me how much better he is at it than me I play keyboard um, and so that's how we soldier on but uh, um, I think uh, um, Grant's uh, um, landmark contribution to it was the recreation of the floppy disk controller and the serial interface. Is that right, Grant? Yeah. Yeah. And um, the hard drive controller, I believe. And the hard drive. Oh, I didn't even know there was a hard drive controller. I didn't know there was a hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be able to talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk we'll about it. Work together on that. Okay. Yeah. So. You know, I, I decided that doing this as a as a panel made the most sense because so many of the people involved are, are in the area. We're going to be here for the event, um, but it just made sense to go ahead and do it that way. Um, and um, so uh, from there, I guess what I wanted to do is uh, get uh, each of the panel members just to briefly talk about, um, you know, their uh, their interest in the, uh, the NABU and um Maybe we can start by um, having uh, Leo, if you can also give just an overview as to what the NABU computer and the NABU network um, is. 
uh, was then and um, you know what raised your interest in it again okay well yeah uh, so how many people in the room because I can see you guys how many people here are Canadian or interested in Canadian computers so pretty much everybody which is kind of cool so did you guys know that there was at least two two manufacturers of, of of absolutely from scratch Canadian computers well actually there's more than that but at least two that went to the consumer level one of which was NABU and the other one uh, was more in the school level which is the Burroughs icon there was other ones that was the MCM 70 but that was a, kind of a, a niche system but NABU was one of the few computers uh, or a few computer companies that was entirely Canadian and um, we actually had several compute, uh, computer models one was the, the NABU PC that we put out specifically for consumers there was a business class computer called the NABU 1100 which was what we used for development before the NABU PC was available so I was there before the NABU PC existed and it appeared while I was still working there uh, there was also a NABU 1600, which was an 8086 computer, but it ran uh, Xenix or Cunix at the time, so it was a multi-user computer, also business class, had several terminals and, and, and uh, the hard drive that actually uh, uh, Grant figured out. But the magic of NABU wasn't so much that we built a computer, because it was it's similar to the, the MSX computer at the time, but that we put a really high-speed serial interface on it at the time, it went 100 kilobits per second. But the other part of the magic was we were able to figure out one, uh, uh, how to insert data into an analog cable stream. Nobody, literally zero people, had done it up to that point. And we actually started off with it going like 2 megabits per second, which at the time was uh, thin net ethernet, 2 megabits per second. Um, but we managed to get it at to 6.3 megabits per second using only one channel. Uh, like, and, and in our case, we used channel 31 at the time in Ottawa. Um, it was, and because it, it was the dirtiest cable station. If you remember, there was a lot of cable stations and cable TV at the time that had interference in them. And whatever, whatever broadcasted, that had interference on it. Um, and 31 was bad because there was a lot of equipment that used it. It was at the high end and there was industrial equipment that, that, that made that band bad. So we, but we could broadcast because we did uh, error correction and that kind of stuff, which was great. So we broadcast 10 megabytes of data over... 13 seconds repeatedly over and over and over and over and over again and what that meant that we could do is is that we simulated the internet way before the internet could appear we could add any content we wanted to the stream and make it work we could also put um, stuff live on the stream and for, and one thing that 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 we had it was technology at the time everybody would be, be really happy to see was in the 80s, everybody had to set their own clocks, whether it was your kitchen clock. Even today, you have to do it for your coffee maker, what, that, that kind of stuff. Um, and one thing that was a problem was nobody knew the time. In fact, people would phone the time. In Ottawa, the, uh, there, there's a number, 613-745-1576, which is NRC's atomic clock. You'll phone, it'll give you a voice. And it, it will actually <laughs> end up uh, 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 giving you the time. But we broadcast the time accurately every uh, 13 seconds so it wasn't perfectly uh, uh, like, like a cell phone is now it wasn't perfectly tuned to the microsecond but it was enough that people could set their watches and clocks by and people did do that which is kind of neat because um, at the time the cable didn't do that moreover we could broadcast it remotely like far so we, we so for instance we broadcast it through it through a satellite all the way to the uh, National Cable Television Show 1983 in Las Vegas. Um, uh, sorry, the, the CES in Las Vegas 1983, we broadcast it directly there and we had NABUs there that could, could listen to it. So that was another neat thing that literally we could do broadband really far. And that was really, really neat. And we, but the other thing that we did was we also went for trying to make a computer on a subscription level. We did not we did sell the computer, a thousand bucks, if you absolutely wanted to buy it. But in fact, we rented it out just like any other piece of hardware at 20 bucks a month. And then you could buy different game levels and software levels. Uh, we gave all the educational stuff for free. And we also put some in schools, just like Apple did and that kind of stuff. So we were actually doing pretty well in Ottawa. We had a penetration of about 15,000 customers that rented the computer and used it. 
And we also had about five schools that had labs that were all NABU, all happening in 1983-84. So that's just a quick, the elevator pitch for what NABU was. And if we and we'll we'll start exploring different aspects of it. But we created a ton of content locally, uh, and we dealt with other content creators. And we didn't even consider we didn't call them games. For instance, we called them titles. We wanted to emulate. We wanted to merge video with computers at the time. And at the time, nobody was doing that. So we were trying to invent the terminology to sort of match it. Anyway, that's a, I don't want to chew up, chew up everybody else's time for introductions, but that's me. That, that, that and I'll get to where, where I am in that story uh, as, as we unfold it. But that's what NABU is. So, so go ahead. I'd like to move now to uh, David, uh, just because I'm um, putting people forward in the stream of lie awareness as this came up. So. You saw it roughly the same time frame I did. I don't know if it was from the same source. And you did click buy now. I didn't click buy now. So, well, what what made you think that it was something that you needed to do? Well, um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I mean, one of the things that I I love about this hobby is whenever someone says, "Well, this is not possible," someone figures out how to do it. So when Adrian Black said, basically. There's this black box, it's basically useless, um, but it looks cool. And when we popped it open, and when you popped it open, and you're sort of looking at what's in there, I think all of it was a buzz amongst our Chilliwack Retro Computer Club that there's potential here. Something's going to happen. And I think like most human beings, you don't want to be left out. <laughs> so I wanted to click on it. I, it was... I forget how much they were selling for. So a bit of a backstory here. Nambu went out of business. Leo went? Uh, it was roughly June 1986. 86. I never even heard of the Nambu until it popped. But somewhere in the U.S., some guy had a warehouse of these things, and they just started popping up on eBay for very reasonable prices. I call them life acceptance factor prices. So my wife wouldn't be upset if I spent <laughs> money on it. And so I thought, you know, if, if I buy this and it ends up being a paperweight, it's still a cool looking black computer that really does it. But was, was it sixty eight dollars, I think, on that first the first batch was around fifty nine dollars. Fifty nine dollars. Fifty nine bucks US, yep. That yeah. was the US, real price. Yes. And you know, um, you can but come up, look, shipping. look at this, it's solid steel construction and keyboard's gorgeous. And it was just something that I thought, well, at the very least, it's a home station. And, uh, you know, so I purchased one, it, it arrived, and I was thrilled. And I didn't think much of it. And then we started to hear stories of people doing things with them. And I'll stop right there because I don't want to say that too much. <laughs> Yeah, and just uh, maybe you can just briefly tell uh, everybody what kind of uh, background you have as a collector, how long you've been collecting, things like that, just so we know what, what would motivate you to click buy it now while other people fear to shred. <laughs> well, I think because of the price, you know, if somehow I did, I, you know, I could lose 50, 60, 70 bucks, and if it never showed up, it wasn't like catastrophic and then we'll lose my house. Um, but I think the other thing that um, is important to know, I'm, I'm a mid-50s guy that have been using technology since the 70s. Um, I'm, my, my background is comp sci and also education. Uh, I've seen sort of in how technology is transformed. But I'm also, um, also sort of looking at the newest technology and I'm thinking, it's wasteful in some ways. Like people are writing code now where the title screen is 500 megabytes. And you think, you know, you look back at the Atari 2600 and what was it, 4K, where they would be writing an entire game. Um, and I'm thinking that is what I can understand. Like if, I, it's, if you can look at it, you can understand the hardware. And, um, you know, if you were. We were at George's session around TRSA emulation. It's it's something that you can really wrap your mind around, and it's something that frankly brings me back to my childhood. So, so I like Tinker, but I do not have the technical skills that these two gentlemen have here. So, 
So then the next thing I see is um, on Facebook, Riz has clicked and said that uh, he bought one too. Yeah. Um, Paul was the first guy. When he's not here as a member, but he posted it that, guys, this is an interesting thing. He just saw the video, and maybe you guys are interested to buy one. And I believe Paul and Grant bought at the same time they did the first box. And I hang up, you know, I start, oh, I can't justify it on my second, my other half, so I got to find some money how to, to get one, right? And the second box from 59 went up to about 90 or $80, something like that. Yeah, $80, yes, with plus shipping. And so it came, it arrived, and I saw that techie guy, and they opened it up. And plug it in. And the first thing I notice is it's so quiet. I said, well, this is a quiet machine. But I found out that the fan stuck. <laughs> so it's not turning. That's because 2,000 of these boxes were sitting in a pallet, apparently, and they are in the same position kind of thing. And the fan is one of those heavy duty fans. So I opened it up. And it did a little bit of adjustment, and then the noise disappeared. And it's good. You can hear the fan. And uh, I played with it, and then have was new software. I got two software from two guys, which is a drama by itself. And I won't say that you know. <laughs> but uh, so after a while, I. I know that Grant created the uh, the oh, yeah. interface, but I didn't. I got the board, but I didn't do the interface yet. So I put it aside. And one day, I took it out again, and now I hear this clang, 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 clang. So what I know about it is that if you let it sit for a long time, it's the balance of the bearing is always like this. What I ended up is grinding a little bit of the fins, and I left a little bit of a distance, so make sure that even if it goes a wonky a little bit, it doesn't make that noise in. Well, so far, my machine is good. So then the, the next thing I hear is Grant's involvement. It sounds like it was actually earlier. I just didn't hear about it right away. Um, and he's, he's not just turning it on and going, gosh, is this thing cool? He's already creating hardware for it. I barely even heard about it. I don't know how you did this. You must have given up sleep or something. Or, um, but yeah. Uh, so how did that come about? Um, well, there was talk on the forums. There's um, uh, you have floppy drive support and serial card support, but you know these boxes that came from the states, they are just the consumer version, and I believe some of the you can print ones that had a floppy drive, but I don't think many people did. The right people have the floppy drive version, um, and so you, there's in the software you can back up your file to go floppy, like save your game or do something. Oh, it didn't work. So anyway, back in the first ten years, um, I also collect other types of computers that have a lot of them. And a lot of them are hard to get. Some of them, they're, some of the uh, boards or cards are unobtainable or nobody has them. So what I thought I'd do is make replicas exactly as I could in the original hardware. And sometimes it's, especially with the uh, chips and stuff, um, being not very available yet, some they can be become very expensive. But I just like to have them, my computers look and feel exactly how they were when they were made. So I worked with uh, Leo for a serial card, and Santo with a floppy drive card, and Leo gave for the hard drive card. And the cards when they produce be basically identical copies using the same chips, because some of them are really hard to get. And you could remake these cards. With modern chips, modern technology, well, this big, 
if you look up on the book and you start to pass it around, the cards are like this big for like a floppy card or a serial card. And, but, you know, you could do it easily with like a card that is big to have. And I think some people have, but these ones are exact replicas of the original. So that's just kind of like how I like to do it. And if you know, like something, like, why would you do that? It's like, man, these cable, blah, 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 blah. But it's nice to have them original. Some people like that, some people don't. And who was the other person's name you mentioned? Sancho. I mean, some are from Ottawa. Well, he's from Ottawa, too. Okay. Theo and him work together on the hard drive. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm sure it would. Well, he basically was the test. Yeah, the, the cards have been oh, purchased from photos, high resolution photos, and different. That's a whole other forum, it's just to not make reproductions. This guy sells himself short. And like I'm talking to him about the weather, and he says, Oh yeah, I, I looked at a photograph of a of a of a circuit board with the chips and so I, I traced that out based on the photograph and, and ran the lines and figured out the chips and now I have a working hard graph. Like I offered to send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I've um, created circuit boards and uh, or designed them using some of the freeware tools that are out there. And I'm constantly running into needing to add a whole bunch of jumpers because there's just no way to get all of the wires going to the same places. So you must have to think about it a different way than the way I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, well, because they're exact copies, it's not, it's, um, you know, then I re re reverse engineer them to the schematic and well, that lots of schematics out there, you, people can redesign them and make them more efficient, and smaller. Is it a, a two layer board or there more than two layers? It's the top and bottom. So okay, yeah. it's very simple stuff from the early years. So. The nice thing about this is that he's got all the information in his website, so it really helps. Yeah, all the schematics and everything are up on the website. So, you get so Leo, uh, you started with the company was it right when they first started up or how did you because you were quite young when you started working there as yeah I, I i was uh i was just out of high school i was uh it was the summer of 1982 and um what had happened was the auto board of education had a computer camp and i was i was one of the counselors but we had also written a bunch of software for them to teach kids how to do basic this is on commodore pets so we did that and we ran through the summer and then it and what happened was is that we got like we were profiled on TV and that kind of stuff that existed it was the first computer camp and that kind of stuff and it was a lot of fun. And um, but Nabu got wind of it or somebody there got wind of it and found out we'd written software for it. So and they were interested in educational software, so they came to us and were looking to license our software. And what actually they did is they didn't didn't end up licensing that software from us. Uh, because they didn't have yet a, a, a basic uh, compiler or basic interpreter, which is our stuff was written in basic. Plus, it was more pet specific, so we'd have to do a lot of changing. But then they figured out they had uh, a bunch of programmers to choose from. There was eight uh, high school students that were all taking computer science and teaching this computer camp as well. So four of us went to um, to NABU and they offered us, they, they offered us jobs. They said, "Here you can you, you can work with writing video games." I said, "Great, great!" So <laughs> I immediately, like I was there the next Tuesday, right after the the, um, uh, the camp ended and uh, they hired me and I started working with other programmers on games and this was in the summer of 1982. Uh, the three other uh, students came with me and uh, like and I was actually the oldest one the the other two Chang Chow and and uh, um, Laura Shenning were 17, and the youngest Greg, was Greg Adams, and he was 16 at the time. And he, we all joined NABU around that time. Now, because I was just, I was in high school, but they were still in high school. Um, I had a, an easier schedule at college. I was going to Algonquin College in Ottawa, um, so I had a lot of time to to work on that and other things at the same time. And I started working with another developer, and I started writing a uh, roulette game um, with him, Ken Shimizu, and basically we we tanned him up with everybody and everybody got like a mentor to work with um and and we had machines to work with as well there were nabu 1100s because the nabu pc wasn't available yet it hadn't been made yet um but this this nabu 1100 system was an s100 system and it had uh a card in it that emulated uh, the, the nabu pc as it was going to be so that's what we wrote video games against at the time 
um, the cycle was 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 being made and was was being engineered. This was at, at the back of Ottawa Cablevision in Ottawa, so we were right close to the actual cable head end at the time. It was kind of neat. Yeah. Uh, Leo, one of the things that um, really astonished me when I first saw uh, one of the ones set up running at one of the uh, Chilliwack Retro Computing Club meetings um, is that I had seen. Um, you know, the implementations of games on things like the VIC-20 and on the Atari 2600. Uh, 2600's version of Pac-Man was just, uh, it was fit-inducing, just about. Um, and, um, you know, in, in seeing the uh, implementations on the Naboo, I mean, they're maybe not remarkable looking at them now, but knowing what computers were like at that time, as, as I do, they are just uh, the animation and the quality of the images and everything are just really, really impressive. Yeah, actually, Pac-Man, I was sort of pushed to the limit. I was just gener making a generic chaser game at the time. I was because I was thinking of making a Pac-Man copy. Not so much. I didn't. I'd never dreamed in my wildest. In my wildest dreams, I didn't think that they were ever going to get the rights to Pac-Man itself. Um, mm -hmm. But I naturally, I used Pac-Man characters and crude approximations approximations of the ghosts and that kind of stuff but they also pushed me to do it better like to get the whites of the eyes which wasn't in the msx version of the pac-man but my pac-man came out before the msx version of the pac-man i got a letter from namco like a reference letter from them saying that it was the best version at the time i it's in one of the videos that i did oh i thought you had some people sorry what was that in Dana down there sorry i didn't hear what uh... oh i thought you received a letter Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh, got a letter from Namco, the president of Namco, <laughs> saying that it was the best version at the time, and it was that was pretty excellent. Like it was just that was that that was ice, uh, icing on the cake. And at and at the time, we I had to keep it secret, which was hilarious because if I, I originally I wasn't keeping it secret, but then they said, oh, we're, we're negotiating the rights, so you got to keep it secret now. So I I gave the the game a different name, called it called it Hairball. But unfortunately, that was like a, a neon flag for people. As soon as they saw it appear in the cycle, they immediately went, "What's this new game called Hairball?" Right? It was like, and and they found out it was actually Pac-Man. So it was kind of a weird thing where I was trying to hide it on the cycle to to test it. Um, but everybody in the company knew it was there, and everybody knew it was going to happen. And we ended up getting the rights that from my game, we ended up getting the rights to. Uh, uh, Galaxian and Dig Dug as well, and we did spectacular versions of, of, of them as well at the time. So Namco, the Namco arrangement, we paid it a million and a half for the initial wow. rights for it, and then we paid royalties, a percentage of royalties. Because we could, we offered a, a premium games tier, which included all the Namco games, and we could price it separately. So for an extra five bucks a month, you got Namco games and Konami games. And that was the kind of neat w thing we could do with, with, with Nabu, is, is that we could say, if you wanted to buy different software you could get access to it and that's sort of how we did that so i was i was it was kind of fun because it was sort of happened by accident that we got all the rights and it sort of sort of all fell into place but it worked out pretty well because i got a nice version out and th th thankfully it's one of the few objects that i've managed to save and we still have the the, the game to this day right so it's uh so when you first said you got a letter we all braced ourselves for being a cease and desist letter <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Was, but, was uh, it was it as a uh, a utility, you can't exactly hide behind a post office box or anything if uh, yeah. you didn't get proper rights. Yeah, the, um, they, they they no, we paid for the rights, and we and Namco the the Namco relationship pushed us into the Konami relationship and other people as well. So you'll see in our cycle, for the people that are looking at it, we had a lot of content going on it. And not all of it was done by us, although we did a lot of original games and stuff like that. Uh, a lot, Some of it came from Nam... Uh, well, we did the conversions for Namco, that was great, but the MSX games came from Konami as MSX titles that we made work on the NABU. We didn't have to do that too much work. We created a special binary piece of software called the Nabu Shim that turned our MSX games into Nabu games so we could wrap the menu around and that kind of stuff on it. If you notice, all the Nabu games are consistent in having, they all have help, online help, like they, they can all generate help and they can, every last application could be paused at any time. So which was, and it had a TV Nabu switch. So the TV switcher was right, is right on the keyboard if you look. And in the 80s, what meant if you were walk, watching hockey, then you could you could you could sort of wait till the commercials came on and you could unpause your game play two minutes of and, and some people actually had an egg <laughs> timer so that they would have the commercials out you know a minute and a half or two minutes and then they would then they would pause their game 
click the TV nabu and boom, the, you know, you'd be back to the game kind of stuff. That's how oh. addicted a lot of people were to some of the, the titles and so on that we were, we, that we were doing. It was kind of neat. Um, just listening to how people use the nabu because remember it had a th- that if the keyboard is, is got a is, it, the cable is like 30 feet long so you can have the computer way at the tv and they get a little bit warm but the keyboard itself was 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 hefty but you could put it on your coffee table these days we don't so much do a coffee table <laughs> when people watch tv some of the rooms are rather small so the tv is like right in front of them but in the 80s remember living rooms were big your just your 20 inch tv was literally 20 feet away from you Right. Uh, and and that's the way we lived. And the the whole family would gather around the TV. So when playing games and that kind of stuff, they'd literally be kids playing games, adults doing their thing and so on. And sometimes interacting at the same time, especially when the educational titles sort of popped up. So that's kind of neat, too. So it's, <laughs> it's almost fair to say that not only did you invent the Internet before the Internet, at least in a consumer context, um, but you also invented the Steam Network before the Steam Network. Yeah, we were trying to do uh, make su- uh, subscriptions, and in fact, even um, uh, 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 developers really liked that. Uh, Konami really liked it. Namu, uh, Namco really liked it because it's more like the arcade model. You pay as you go, kind of thing, right? And you rented the computer for twenty bucks a month, and you got a whole pile of titles. As I said, all the educational ones. This was the big hook for 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 parents. This is when we, because because we were in schools, like five, as I said, five elementary schools, and what we'd do is we'd set up a lab with like twelve of them, and the for the it was convenient for the school because all they'd had to do was get one cable drop, and then ever all the computers could share that one cable drop, and then typically we'd put a printer. Uh, uh, on one of them so that uh, 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 people, students would go to that one to do printing but we also made that one so you could use all of them had floppy drives so that they could save their work all of, so all of them could get at for instance our flagship language was uh, Logo my, MIT's Logo and MIT actually did our version of Logo we sent them an Apple 1100 just mailed it to them we got the, the 1100 back and a, a floppy that had a binary on it that was logo and it worked perfectly when we put it up on the cycle it was one of those weird things that we got this is this is weird like we just, all we got is a binary we don't have the source code to logo it, uh, uh, ever in our hands and here we are just loading the application directly and it's working and it became the flagship thing and schools used it a ton in uh, and they used it in the labs and then the hook was kids were going to their they're saying and remember the whole school was using them because they'd actually just let you know different classes use them for about an hour and then the kids would go home and say, you know, mom, dad, you could just rent the computer for 20 bucks a month just during the school year, right? Now, the kids' thing was to get access to the video games. The parents would see it as they get access to their educational software and, and literally stuff they were doing homework on, logo. Sometimes we'd, we'd rent the floppy drives, too. The floppy drives were rentable at 10 bucks a month. So everything was rentable in the whole ecosystem, which was happening long before anybody was thinking about doing that. Um, in, in that time frame, I remember that the uh, biggest objection to buying a computer that I would hear, especially anyone, say, age 40 or older, is, oh, there's a better thing coming out you know, next week, next month, fill in the blanks. But a lot of people wound up being paralyzed, um, you know, with the indecision because they knew that something better was coming. It seems like this was the solution to all of those uh, types of objections. Well, it, it, people could try it for nothing, right? They could, you know, they, they could throw 20 bucks down and try it for a month and see we'll see if they liked it in general if they if they rented it they'd nor- they normally kept it uh so it was kind of that was the way it worked the uh, uh, uh and and th- but some people would return them mostly because they either couldn't afford it or they weren't interested anymore which was actually fine because they entered them back into the ecosystem we would repair them spruce them up we even had touch-up paint that was that weird gray color oh, <laughs> like a can of it and and i actually have one so, unit that ha- that had been touched touch- so you could you actually see the touch-up paint spot i just on. want to go to david for a second He's oh. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought that was you uh, raising your hand. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask. I was just going to mention something about forgiveness. Sure, go ahead. Well, I think one of the neat things, because like you said, Leo, the, this was the internet before the internet. Yeah. And then when it went away and there was that whole, well, this box is not useful. I'm wondering about talking a bit about the resurrection of the NABU network, because that's what fascinates me. Well, you mean what's going on right now? <laughs> yeah. So, pretty much, sorry, pretty much the history, I guess, with DJ. 
Okay, I'll, I'll give you the quick, there's lots of documentation, there's lots of videos about this, so if you're interested, you can just look for my name, Leo Leo Nabu, on, 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 on uh, uh, YouTube now, and you'll find lots of them. Uh, but the short, the, the, the short story is that what happened was, is I've tried to revive NABU and get people interested in the past before. It only had a limited shelf life because only there was only a small amount of people that knew about it. If people in Ottawa and people in Alexander, Virginia, which was where we were, were in the States, and which is the source of those 2,500 computers that were on eBay. The Tribune Cable in Alexander, Virginia had them. And that when they, when, when NABU went, and ex exploded we're basically they were left there and somebody they were sold at some auction and that kind of stuff and that's how they were they, but those are from tribune cable um but the what, what actually happened afterwards is that so i had some in my basement and i had whole cycles i have copies of the cycles a couple of them but they're running on they're on 40 year old computers and some of them are on floppies some high density floppies, some low density floppies, but sitting in a box for 40 years. In 2009, I recovered a bunch for York University. I just basically went through the floppies and I figured out how I could extract the stuff and bring it to a PC. So, and then I zipped them up and I sent them off to, to uh, Zbigniew of Stachniak at uh, York University. And he did a NABU display and they did a NABU emulator and it's all at York University and you can look at it that. So if you look at York NABU up on, on uh, um, uh, on, on on Google, you'll find another another Nabu site, and you'll see all of the stuff I did in 2009 because that's where you got that stuff from. But then recently, when those computers popped up, and Adrian Black did his video, another dude by the name of DJ Schurz, who actually, is, weirdly enough, is related to the founders. There was a, a two founders named uh, Ron Schurz and John Bobak, and he, and and he was related to both of them. John Bobak was his uncle, and um, he started to he's really clever and he had started hacking it and he had a lot of stuff and some documentation and he started hacking it and figuring out how to do it. So I noticed he was getting pretty far because I've been watching every now and again, I go on YouTube and I go NABU and I see what's going on and then I see stuff. But in this particular case, I had actually given up. I'd stopped doing that. Uh, and the main reason why was because John Kelly, the founder died earlier that year in 2022. And I said, this, that was the end. He's, this is, this, this is, this would have been great if John Kelly was still around. And I said, we're done. Like this, nobody's interested in this stuff anymore. So it was interesting when other people were like the, the, these eBay computers being sold and that kind of stuff. And I can see it all happening. And now I'm going, well, maybe this guy can get somewhere. So I said, I tried to contact him on LinkedIn and I said, basically, eventually I, I, I said, I just sent him one LinkedIn message that was essentially, I said, if, if you connect with me, all your NABU dreams will come true. That's all I said. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was five minutes later that I got the LinkedIn thing that, uh, and, and we, we started a conversation that night and I said, you know, you're, you've gotten pretty far. So what I'll do is I'll send you what what amounts to me is the God particle. We have this thing called pat, packet 00001 of the cable. And that, that contains both what you see behind me, this main menu, and um, the operating system as well. If you can run the operating system and this menu shows up, you basically have made, uh, you've made the connection to NABU. So I sent it to him and it, of course it didn't work right away, but then he tinkered with it and probably within an hour and a half, he was loading that thing and he, and I could hear it. That was the funny part was it because by that point we're on the phone, right? <laughs> Cause you know, LinkedIn chat is too slow. I had gone home, I was at work and I basically went home and I got on the phone with him and I said, this is what you need to do. This is what this is, this is what's happening when this is occurring. When you see this message, this is what's occurring. When you see this is, and then basically he got through it. And that was really, really neat because I, it was the first time I'd heard somebody creating a new adapter. I already had the capability of simulating adapter using NABU's because I, I have the development environment, but he didn't. And when he, he did that, I said, okay, you did really good. So here you go. Here's the rest of it. And I sent him one copy of the cycle that had literally a hundred applications in it. And, um, he started loading and he started making it work and that kind of stuff. And then we started making, he started making videos about that. And I said, ah, well, you know, should I put up anything? And I put up a video that was made by me. It was by, uh, or sorry, by, by a local TV station in Ottawa called CGOH. They did a profile on me back in 1984, September 1984, just actually about a month before NABU kind of folded the first time. There was three folds going on in that universe. And, um... But I posted that on YouTube, and everybody thought that was really, really cool. <laughs> so 
since then I've been post I've been basic I basically tore apart my basement, my garage and other storage shed things and underneath flower pots and that kind of stuff and I've I've I have nine Nabus that I've uncovered. When I, when I left Nabu, John Kelly uh, it, it was it was about a month before it basically completely folded forever. And I knew it was happening. And the main reason that I left is because John Kelly was paying my salary. He was paying everybody's salary out of his own pocket. And I said, you know, I'm kind of clever. People, other people will pay me. We're done. So we, I might as well, John, we're, we're good. he said, just keep the stuff. We might fire it up someday. So, and in fact, he had a party in like 2002 where um, he, out of his own money, he, he, he rented a golf club and he invited all ex Nabu people and we were there and we had a great time. And as, as it, it must have cost like 25,000 bucks, but it was a great party and we had a lot of, we had a lot of fun and we got to meet everybody. We had a Nabu reunion. And we all, in, in 2009, after your conversity did it, we had one, another reunion uh, at the Canadian Museum of Science Technology in Ottawa. And there was a bunch more people. And lately, I've been having reunions with people because they know I'm doing this YouTube stuff. And like Eric Antela, who was director of engineering, he gave me a couple. He called me over and, he, and we had a conversation. And he told me all kinds of really cool facts. Like we had sold the technology to Japan for 100K Canadian. And I'm going, oh, my God. This, and even in 1980, that was, that was such a low number. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um um, but it never it and there was a Japan installation of Nabu by the way they had a really cool black one I've seen it that had you know a, a, a hiragana and kanji keyboard uh, similar to the MX, uh, MSX keyboard but it was basically the same Nabu case except jet black um, and and it had their own MSX software running on it, their own cycle and that kind of stuff and that was really neat too. So uh, and Kane Ishii was a big fan of Nabu and uh, he was he's the father of MSX. And he always wanted us to do stuff with him. And that's how he's he's the one that introduced us to like Konami uh, way in the past after we we were doing the and, and made sort of smooth the way for us to do stuff with Konami and other game manufacturers at the time. So. And I just want to circle back to Grant before I lose my train of thought, because prior to standing up here in this room, I did not know there was a hard drive interface. Was there actually a hard drive as a. As a product for not, it, or not, is this not for consumers. Or the, the hard drive was used by us as developers, so we really, really, really ate our own dog food. By the originally, we used the Nabu 1100 as our development machine, but the Nabu 1100 had many, many flaws. Plus, it was slightly different from the Nabu PC, so we ended up using a Nabu PC as a development machine and another Nabu PC as a target machine. And then what we did is we hooked them up together over that high-speed interface, and then we tested using that. We one computer would pretend it was a da an adapter running the cycle, and the other computer would load as if it was adapter, and it and it, oh. well, it didn't know any better, which is kind of neat. So we would. Yeah, a what, lot of, what is the nature of the uh, interface? Is it an MFM? What type of hard yes, drive? Yes, it was. Is it uh, to okay, so. It's MFM. Yeah. Nabu had a product. So how does anyone find a working MFM drive to actually use it in this day and age? Well, here's the cool. Here's the cool. Emulator. Yes. Sorry. Oh, I see. Okay. You can use the MFM emulator, and there's there's people trying to working on a CF card. Oh, okay, that would be nice. Yeah. But, but and so, but the drive itself uh, sees an MFM, or sorry, the interface sees an MFM drive. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Present, the, present the, the interface really isn't much other than just a, a bridge to the to the drive controller yeah. and to the hard drive itself. So you need an external drive and a and the hard drive. Yeah. And even with an emulator, you still need the external drive controller. Okay. And so that's a um, a box that's unique to this, or is that something? No, it's a get standard from? like a SA one thousand. Okay. Yeah. Hard drive, but they're they're pretty hard to find. There's, I'm working on a CF card implementation of it. Oh, awesome. In fact, what we're doing is we're just showing a history, a history that well, a lot of Canadians don't know about. You guys do now. Um, but even, uh, it's, it's difficult to get, even like, uh, uh, for instance, I, I uh, contacted the Museum of Science and Technology in Ottawa, which is now called Ingenium. Um, and they're interested in me donating all my stuff to them. That's it. So, but like as far as making a display or, or showing it, less so. So, um, it, it's kind of nice that you guys are because you actually are the first uh, group in in Canada that's interested. Last week I was at I was doing uh, VC, VCF Southwest 
I did a, a session with them. Didn't go so well. The audio was kind of bad. Um, but uh, the point is that there's a lot of interest going on in the U.S. because those those computers existed on, on eBay. But it's kind of nice to see there's Canadian interest in, interest in basically Canadian computer with Canadian software. And I did a talk this morning about uh, Canadian technical developments. Um, and I've done it in uh, um, California, I did it last year. And I find that, uh, you know, telling Americans about a Canadian innovation, um, you know, half of them dismiss it as um, being the adult talk in a Charlie, uh, uh, Charlie Brown comic. Um, and uh, the other half just simply won't believe it or it doesn't count or, you know, something like that. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm surprised at the reactions I get when I tell these stories in Canada about the different things that were invented here. People have no idea. Like, we, we don't do a very good job of telling uh, the world about what we've done. Um, you know, this is, I think it's a, a relatable example. I talk about uh, some of the, the, um, the one-bit adder tube thing invented by a Canadian. Most people would didn't know they needed a one bit adder or a tube. But when we talk about something like this, I think it's something everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what caused the end of the original um, project? Like what what caused them to be, to shut down and become a solvent or? Well, it happens. It's it's like every type of the, 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 the first time we failed was mostly because we had one big investor in Ottawa. There was one big real estate magnet called Robert Compo. He built most of the downtown skyscrapers and that kind of stuff. And we had a, uh, a line of credit with him. I mean, literally was pretty much bottomless. <laughs> and John Kelly knew him personally, and he loved Nabu. He thought it was great. However, his, in the, in the, in the mid eighties, real estate took a dive. Interest rates went through the roof. If you recall, um, real estate become a, became a real problem to hold on to. And his company that was a billion dollar company at the time went, did not become a billion dollar company. and was in the process of getting rid of their assets. And one of them, they had an on demand note. And that was, that was basically, they called it, it was a 60 day line of credit. And so we had to find another investor really, really quickly. It didn't happen. Um, and then what happened was is that we made a smaller version of the company that contained a lot of other employees while we tried to sell the technology to somebody else. Um, we got it all the way at RCA, all the way to the board of directors, and the chairman of the board thought that it wasn't going to go no, go anywhere, so it didn't happen. And, for, and as we all know, RCA didn't end up going anywhere and is now just a brand name that's sold out of whatever whoever buys pays the most money for the license <laughs> so uh it's no longer in really in existence as it was uh so that's essentially uh, walmart what we're... dvd players what's that sorry a uh, rca rca the brand name of walmart dvd players exactly you know they become like black and decker <laughs> and so on They're, they don't really exist except in our memories <laughs> and how did nabu get access to those cable channels did they did they own any part of the cable company or anything no 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 we just that? we we were just in with the we, we were literally the, john kelly had convinced them to so that to do it and there was an, in ottawa there was two cable companies auto cablevision and skyline cablevision and they had a dividing line of bank street which was one was east of bank street west of bank street um but auto cablevision was very keen on nabu and as i said we were using up a channel that they were literally were not broadcasting on so it was very very easy to to provide that kind of uh, um uh support so that's kind of neat so, so I've been hogging all of the questions. Uh, <laughs> you want to get some other that, people uh, in? We've got a live audience I'll here. So uh, I'd like to just uh, see if we can throw it open now and find out what kind of uh, questions there are out there. Don't all jump up at once. <laughs> <laughs> you did a pretty good job explaining everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. Oh. I just, if everything had gone perfectly and the, and the company had continued, what would scalability look like? Like, because you started off at just Ottawa, how would that spread out if things had gone better? Were you able to hear the question? No. Could you repeat it, please? I was just asking about scalability. If the company had been, like, had been spread out past in Ottawa, how, how that would that have scaled up? It would have scaled up, but uh, there was a couple opportunities. But let me let me uh, finish with something that where we were talking about scale. 
when Nabu appeared, there was no competition. They, they, we had like it was Tiracetes, Pets, and like the Atari 800, but that had AK RAM, which was nothing. So it was it was considered a cartridge machine. Um, so when Nabu appeared, it was actually kind of a a, a pretty high end computer at the time, but as almost instantly. The Commodore 64 appeared later on in 1983. After our launch, there was the Commodore 64. It was announced in January 1983, but it didn't appear until Christmas of 1983. And it was 800 bucks, like at the time, Canadian. So we were going, we were renting it for 10 bucks a month. <laughs> so uh, we, we thought it was a better value. But we created a <laughs> cartridge, and I actually have, I was on my desk when I left, there was a a, uh, a NABU adapter for the Commodore 64 that was loading a Commodore 64 menu using the cartridge slot as to cause it to boot. And we also had, and this is my favorite toy that I should have took on the way out the door, was an FM adapter. The, in other words, we broadcast and somewhere in like 108, uh, 108 megahertz, which nobody could license as a bandwidth, but the Canadian government would let you use as, as for scientific research and for whatever else. And they were broadcasting the cycle on that and it ran perfectly on, cable, on, on FM. In other words, it was broadcastable without a cable company in the way. And I thought that would have been the best thing to do. So he changed. He's exactly. Yeah. Anybody could have done it. Like literally anybody could put pop up an FM and, and literally broadcast whatever data they wanted. And we were doing that in 19, that was 1986, that was on my desk. So um, the, the co company survived, the technology survived a company called Adaptive Broadband, which still exists. And they ended up beaming stuff to uh, ocean liners, weather information and weather maps digitally. That's exactly what the technology evolved into. Now they do radio networks where they down, they send whole programs, radio uh, and, and that kind of stuff. And it's, it's still in existence, yeah. but it was bought by somebody else already. It's gone, I think. But anyway. So, um, we're on. So, um, yeah, we um, are going to have the um, computer here for a few minutes after we're, we're finished the problem part. So you can come up and uh, have a look and see for yourself. Uh, the quality of manufacturing in there. And are it does anybody know are there still computers out there or are they all been sold now? Uh, the, the vendor is putting out some. But I the odd one here there. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing but you can use the MAME emulator, which works choice. perfectly well. If you actually want to explore the software library, you can. And that's kind of nice. So Brian Johnson made a MAME emulator that works perfectly well. And can, you can you can see exactly the le the level of software that we had and the amount of stuff that we had, and 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 the amount of educational stuff we had as well, which is kind of neat. Uh, stuff we had loading logo programs so that we could demonstrate how to write logo programs, which is kind of neat. <laughs> I thought that that was cool. We treated the cycle as kind of like a fl uh, a big hard drive to us. Like we loaded cable resources like file names, and it was identical from loading them in through a a, a, a file handle in CPM, for instance. It worked the same to us. It was kind of nice, and it was just a, it was just and it was faster than a Commodore 64 floppy drive. I remember the Commodore 64 floppy drive came out. I was appalled at how slow it was, <laughs> and and it wasn't even fast as the high speed serial interface on the Nabu. So we had it. We had them there too, and our floppy was nice too. It was you you had. Sorry, go ahead, David. Yeah, I was just going to make a comment because uh, Dale, you were mentioning DJ, and I sort of did a deep dive on his videos, and it was I had no idea that he was actually related to the founders. But what I loved about the whole process is his tie back to education, and he's actually very uh, much into robotics and educational robotics at schools. So uh, when I was looking at his uh, establishment in Calgary, I'm like. Well, you know, the, the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and some of his videos are just priceless. So if you haven't had a chance to check out your videos on YouTube channel, I think I, it would be worth your while. My only met Sorry, him for, I, I only met him in person when we went to VCF East. Uh, and he, he flew here from the Thunder Bay here in Ottawa, and then we drove down to VCF East in New Jersey, and it was a blast. <laughs> so, uh, and he did he did a presentation as well, which isn't up, but I did one, I, a similar one that I did before, but it was more of an update to 
what had happened, uh, other stuff that had been happening. And so it's, it's, but yes, it's indeed, DJ has been, been, been really, really helpful because I just don't have enough time to go through a lot of the stuff. So it's easier to hand it off to different people just not just DJ, but other people. Um, I just hand off the code and so on. I say, you know, see if you can make it work because <laughs> I don't have time <laughs> and they have. So I've been posting like on GitHub, the source code for Pac-Man and Minor 24 and Qbert all games that we did and i'm trying to find other source code as well that's on floppies and that's a little bit more tricky process i found <laughs> yeah no, we... if i may add to uh i would like to say thanks to dj as well because as you know it is internet dependent yeah uh, however he lately now allowed that all the class can be stored on a is in your PC or laptop or your server so that you can now do all the work that it does offline. Yep. Oh, nice. That is one of the things that I like lately uh, yeah. with the Nabu. I'm and sure what he appreciates about, it. Uh, the new option board that came out that they're debating from the Nabu into the ROM um, WBW, which is the RC 2014. Oh. If you are um, if you are aware of RC 2014, it's a set 80 uh, projects that run CPMs and uh, other languages. There is now a guy that came out with a board, and I think he's working with you on uh, how to make it perfect to be plugged in into the Labo and becomes a full CPM RC2014 um, compatible. Cool. So that you can also expand the number all the way out to all the boards that came out for RC2014. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also you can you can you can get that with Cloud CPM as well because DJ made a version of CPM that uses the NABU as it was supposed to use, the high speed interface becomes a two way conduit for getting files from your PC and that kind of stuff. So you can put files in a P, in a folder on your PC and it will look like a CPM folder to the yes. to, to, to CPM. And that's very powerful for me because all my stuff is CPM based. So if I'm trying to make things work, it's handy to move it quickly from a PC. And you can get that at nabu.ca where he has the uh, he, his internet adapter as well. So that's kind of nice, Cloud CPM. I was just going to add, um, if you take any way thing away from this presentation, or if you go see uh, the Chilliwack Retro Computer Club, look closely at the machines because you'll see some stock machines that haven't changed from the 80s. But I think what's even more interesting, and the Nabu is a perfect example of that, is actually seeing the modern add-ons that make things a lot simpler. So you'll see a little box, maybe 3D printed, on the side where it's actually now using a CF or a compact flash or uh, any of the solid state. And now you have the entire software library at your fingertips that you can use. So part of this hobby is actually keeping these things running, but the other part is like Riz was just explaining the continuous community of uh, building and maintaining and adding features that I never thought possible, like aging and a beautiful or to die. It's pretty Well, I think that's all of our time. So I'd like to thank everyone who was involved and uh, thank you, Leo, because it's probably almost the middle of the night here now. No, no, no. It's only 7 p.m. No. <laughs> <laughs> Is it winter there? Uh, no, it's, it's not winter here. It is. It, it is like it is like Vancouver. It's the rainy season today. Yeah. <laughs> it's forty millimeters of rain or something. So, uh, and by way of a thanks from the club to all of our panel members, uh, Leo included, uh, we have the very rare and coveted uh, limited edition uh, Chilliwack uh, Retro Computing Club coffee mug, uh, suitable for holding almost any form of liquid. <laughs> so, uh, pass that down. <laughs> and. Um, uh, Leo, I am going to carefully wrap one in a box and uh, hand it off to uh, Revenue or to, uh, to Canada Post. Um, hand it off to Canada Post and uh, have them grind it into shards and send it to you. So, okay. uh, <laughs> and I then if, if you're ever uh, someplace where you're the same place as me, I can give you another one that's not broken into shards. <laughs> I think that you know one mug in a box this size should be about right. So. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. So I'll follow up to get your mailing address. Yep. Cool. Okay. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Th- thanks, everybody, for coming. Well, that's a nice crowd. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Leo. Thanks. That's great.